Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kirish, and uh, with me I have Venu. Uh, we co presenting this talk. Uh, we kind of uh, going to explain how within NVIDIA we're uh, using why do, why are we doing uh, real time traffic monitoring of packets leaving the VM and entering the VM. How we how are we doing it? Obviously, traffic monitoring occurs on the interfaces that's passed into the word launcher pod. Uh, we're going to kind of uh, touch upon various interfaces that is uh, assigned to the word launcher pod, and then how we can do traffic monitoring for each uh, type of the interface. Uh, so we're going to look at WET, we're going to look at the legacy SRO VBF, uh, legacy SRO VFIO, which basically passed through VFs. We're looking, we're going to look at switch dev uh, types of SRO VBFs, and then we're going to uh, look at how OBS is being used for port mirroring to do traffic monitoring. And then how OVN, which is the SDN that we use internally in NVIDIA, it's also a default CNI uh, in OpenShift. So how we use OVN to configure the OBS port mirroring. And finally, how we use the Kubernetes native API, a custom resource called port mirroring, to configure OVN, which in turn configure OBS. So the stack is at the very bottom, we have OBS running on every node. And then you have a distributed urban SDN control plane that configures the OBS and the OVN itself is configured uh, is configured or managed by the oven Kubernetes CNI. So just a call out, uh, this is uh, uh, a follow-up talk on what was presented last year in Kubert Summit 2023. Again, thank you for the opportunity last year and this year as well. So this is just a follow-up uh, on that talk. This the, the previous year's talk kind of deep dives into the entire uh, oven Kubernetes CNI project, which is open source based project, uh, which is on top of OVN, which is again open source and which is on top of OPS. So let's get to why do we want to monitor traffic, right? So one of the expensive resource that's there today in an AI infrastructure cloud is a GPU. So it's, an, it's a, you know, we want to kind of uh, have two things. One is uh, high utilization of the GPU and then also the right use of the GPU, sorry, GPU. Right, we want to use the GPU to the maximum extent possible. At the same time, we want to make sure it's being used for the right intended purposes. So we have uh, various use cases where we rent this GPU on the cloud and then people come in and then use it uh, for the wrong purposes. It could be crypto mining or it could be anything else out there. So we want to identify such use cases, right? That's one, one, one thing that we want to do. Uh, and we want to do it uh, uh, outside of the Kubert VM wrapper, uh, inside which uh, the actual, uh, workload runs. We don't want to uh, SSH into the workload and then, you know, into the running VM and then try to find out what's happening there. So we want to do it uh, uh, in an opaque manner outside of this uh, Qbert VM so that the malicious user cannot disable this feature uh, within, if it's, if it were to be inside the VM, then the malicious user could have disabled it. So we want to do it uh, from the host, uh, not from the switch, from within the host, how we can do it and then how we can do it in a Kubernetes native way. Right through Kubernetes API that the deployers can uh, can kind of create an object out of and then apply it and then immediately see it. So one is to detect any malicious use of uh, the GPU. Uh, live troubleshooting is another use case uh, to do fine grained accounting and billing. Uh, and then also uh, once we figure out something is not right, we need to kind of work on what action we can take. Uh, you know, either terminate the Kubert VM or, or do something else like suspend it and things like that. So there's various various reasons why one would want to do uh, real time uh, traffic monitoring of the packets leaving the VM, like a replay system, IDS, and so on. So let's look at the uh, WET interfaces. Right today, when you create a word launcher pod, you can it can be multi homed, uh, and then each of the interfaces uh, inside the pod itself it can be a WET pair. One end of the WET pair is inside the pod; the other end is uh, on the host, right? And then uh, inside the uh, work launcher pod itself you have kubert networking uh, with the uh, bridge mode and then uh, and then you have all this uh, uh, vertio backend interfaces which is called as vnet zero vnet one vnet to here and within the vm the web vm here for example when you run eth tool minus i on each of this you'll see that it's a vertio uh, front end uh, device right these are all vertio devices so in this case Obviously, you can run TCP dump on on the on the web interfaces on the host, and then you can kind of do the traffic monitoring. But the problem with this model is that performance, right? There's so many layers that the packet has to, you know, endure uh, before it's actually sent on the wire. So you have the hypervisor uh, layer here, and then the bridging, and then finally the host Linux kernel stack, 
and then finally the ether gets forwarded or routed and then finally it's put on the hardware queue and then nick hardware queue and then finally on the switch so the various layers and obviously uh, the performance would be very bad um so there comes in sroV right so sroV is the de facto standard uh, way of providing uh, uh, interfaces to vms uh, if you if performance is very if network performance is very critical for the workload and SRVF obviously uh, it's basically uh, behind a physical function you can you know we, this entity presents itself multiple times and each of the virtual function has its own PCI PDF so uh, and then you can have up to 256 uh, VFs per port um, and then these VFs are assigned to the VM and then the VM gets access to the network hardware resources and uh, therefore network performance there are two types of SROV interfaces, right? One is the legacy SROV where uh, the VF, uh, you can see here, the VF uh, from the PF is directly uh, passed into the pod. And uh, from the host, now you don't see the VF because VF is now in the pods, the network namespace. So from the host, you cannot run any TCP dump or anything on it. And you can minimally configure things like uh, MAC anti-spoofing, right? And then you can uh, specify what VLAN uh, the VF is on, and maybe few filters here and there. It's not very flexible. Uh, you cannot do any advanced uh, offload. Of course, it gives you a kernel bypass, but uh, nothing more. Uh, you can do very minimal uh, set of things uh, with this particular uh, legacy SRV. Uh, so the new mode of SRV or new type of SRV is called a switch dev SRV. What happens in switch dev is the e-switch, the hardware e-switch that is present on the network interface card is directly exposed as a controllable entity to the Linux switch dev uh, framework. Um, and then through TC, through Linux TC, you can configure uh, this switch hardware using the vendor driver, right? Every, the TC, the TC layer is uh, constant across all the vendors. Um, the TC layer calls into the vendor driver and the vendor driver will uh, configure the respective uh, e-switch controller. Uh, and then thereby, uh, you can uh, provide uh, provide uh, the host with a uh, lot of advanced network services, which all can be offloaded. So that's the beauty of switch dev, where uh, the the flexibility is immense and offload capability is also immense. And then um, you know it's much more powerful, and then it's all written on top of TC. So let's look at how legacy SRV is used in Kubert and how switch dev SRV is used in. Uh, Kubert, uh, and then of the two SROV instances, um, which one is uh, more amenable for traffic monitoring, right? So again, as I said at the beginning, we want the traffic monitoring to be done uh, on the host itself, not on the switch. Uh, why on the host? Like there are use cases where you can run SFlow on the top of the rack switch, collect samples, aggregate it as a central collector, and then kind of uh, make some sense out of it. But again, it's sampling. It's not every packet coming in. Uh, it's uh, uh, and the collector might get overwhelmed because you're now pushing everything to a central entity. And if you have thousands of nodes with thousands of pods, now you have packets coming in from uh, this huge number of uh, large number of uh, uh, you know endpoints. So it, it does not scale very well. So we want monitoring to be done in a distributed manner, and then also a decision to be made in a distributed manner where we inspect the packet on each of the node itself and then take the decision. So let's look at uh, uh, the legacy SRV, right? In this case, uh, you carve out the VF from the PF, assign the VF to the work launcher pod, and then you again do the same thing, the bridging, and then create VNets. And then kind of uh, basically the Vertio uh, backend devices will be here and the front end will be here. And again, there are it's network performance wise, you still have this hypervisor boundary and then still have this bridging here. Uh, so network performance wise, even though you gave the VF, it's not that great. But the thing again here is that uh, you can run TCP dump for traffic monitoring, but you cannot, you have to basically enter NS enter into the host, into the pods network namespace and then run TCP dump. You cannot do it from the host. So uh, a lot of the CNIs like SRV CNI uh, kind of leverages where we pass the VF and puts the VF its own VLAN, okay? So the, the other model here is uh, uh, legacy SRV itself, but uh, VFIO uh, driver. What VFIO does is it basically passes through the VF directly to the VM. 
So as you can see for the set two interfaces uh, inside the net one, there is no corresponding uh, uh, Linux bridge in the launcher port. The VFs are directly passed through an ETH tool minus I on each of these things. You will see an actual uh, driver, like Intel driver or Mellanox driver. You'll see the actual driver attached to this VF. Uh, but this is still a Vertio device here. And then again, if you want to debug, uh, good luck with that because uh, you can only TCP dump on interface. Now it goes through the VFs on the whole. You will not have any insight into it. So the only way out is to work with your ring uh, on the switches. You get the packet and then you do light bugging. So or you kind of. Uh, Give the VM itself using Word Cuttle console or SSH into the VM and then do the debugging here. So uh, that's the problem with the VFIO pass through. Uh, and, and then uh, when you're using the legacy server even more because the VFs are directly passed through, uh, are, because the VFs are directly passed through into the web VM and there's no control plane component on the host uh, to do anything uh, with regard to this VF. So let's look at the switch dev mode, right? So in switch dev mode, what happens is that Every VF that is carved out of a PF, uh, there are two things. Uh, there are two things uh, uh, associated with it. Uh, the first thing is the VF itself, and the second thing is a NetDev device on the host. And this NetDev device is called a, a VF representer. It's called port representer, and this port representer is the. You can think of it like a shadow device, or you know, and you control everything uh, through this NetDev device on the host. Um, so the TC rules that get added will all be on this NetDev device, and then that those TC rules will eventually end up on the eSwitch hardware of the NIC, and, and therefore everything uh, coming uh, through that VF gets offloaded on the NIC. The entire data plane, uh, the firewall rules, the load balancing, uh, DNAT, SNAT, forwarding, everything gets offloaded onto the NIC uh, thanks to these representative devices, and then uh, the TC rules that get configured on these representative devices. So in this model, what happens is that, um, like I said, every VF has two things. One is the VF itself that gets passed through into the VM. And the second thing is the VFIO device, sorry, the, the VF, uh, the representer net device that is on the host. So we take this representer net device and we add it to the OVS, right? Once we add it to the OVS, OVS has this construct called port mirroring. And using that port mirroring, now you can say that all the packets coming through this VF representer uh, just uh, forward it to this particular interface we're going to add. And then you can now start monitoring real time all the packets coming to the VM without involving any network admin. Everything happens um, uh, on the host itself. Uh, the other uh, thing here is the network performance uh, for VFIO uh, is obviously great, in the, especially in the switch dev mode, because all the offload capability, capabilities like uh, firewall, uh, DNAT, DNAT, everything happens uh, on, on in the hardware itself. So I'm going to kind of now uh, pass the uh, baton over to Venu. When you want to go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Girish. So I think uh, as Girish mentioned before, right? So we uh, all this is in the context of um, Avan Kubernetes CNI, and the way it, um, you have several layers, right? So you have OVS, you have OVN, you have Avan Kubernetes as a CNI, and then all run through Kubernetes APIs. So let's just go bottom up to try and see how we can build this uh, uh, infrastructure to help us uh, monitor traffic in real time, right? So talking about OVS itself, OVS, um, um, as Girish mentioned, provides means to um, mirror traffic from one of its OVS port to another OVS port. Um, you can select the source port, you can select which direction you want to start mirroring at the packets um, uh, on uh, on that source port. And then you have a dedicated output port wherein you can send all the traffic. Um, so on the left side, if you uh, have a pod, let's say it's running a service, uh, it could be any service, it could be an ML-based service, it could be just um, a debugging service or um, pretty much any kind of service, right? So you create a width pair uh, as shown in the diagram. You plug one of the end of the width pair to the um, bridge, OVS bridge, um, which has all the other ports uh, connected to, and then give other end of the width pair to the pod or to the service that, um, that's interested in looking at these packets. And then you configure OVS rules. And the examples are shown here, which says that you pick a source port, in this case, 
the first example picks um, the say net zero, which is VF one R, which is the representative for the um, VF given to net zero, and then it picks up the bet zero as the port that you want to send the packets to, and then cre create a mirror in both directions, which is indicated by select the source port as net zero and destination port as net zero. So you select both source and destination going to that port, and send everything to um, the output port with this width zero. When that happens, you'll see all the packets come in with one, and the port starts um, getting all the packets that are being sent over or uh, to um, net zero in real time. Similarly, you have some uh, options you can configure. You can, with respect to directions, um, um, when you configure the measuring rules. Um, next slide, Girish. But one of the uh, things that Girish mentioned and the uh, use case for switch dev is being able to um, use VF representers, give it to Qbert VM, and offload everything uh, at the same time because you want applications with low latency and high performance to uh, benefit from the offload um, um, offload feature. Right. So once you start having wet pairs and start mirroring, um, you start losing some of these offload uh, capabilities because the wet itself is not. Uh, a hardware construct, right? So the E switch in the hardware doesn't know anything about the width. So the moment you start configuring mirroring use rules using width pairs, um, it doesn't know what to do. So everything goes into software, which we don't want. So one of the, um, uh, we spoke about virtual functions. Um, you can use virtual functions for mirroring as well. Um, you can use the representer port as one of the um, OVS port and then start mirroring to it and then give the VF to um, a service and uh, use it that way. But uh, VFs are a little heavyweight uh, and um, limited resources. So you so you don't want to do, if possible, you don't want to do that. There comes in um, scalable functions. Um, SFs are very much like VFs, but they are very lightweight. Um, they have a parent PCI function uh, and use some of the resources from the parent itself, but they also have the their own queues and such like. The uh, one of the biggest advantage of SFs in the context of mirroring is they can be dynamically created and destroyed. So, one of the uh, use cases for the mirroring would be on demand. Right, you want to do this monitoring on demand, uh, not necessarily uh, right from the beginning to the end. So that. In that case, uh, creating this SF when you need it and uh, deleting it when you don't becomes very useful. Um, and um, they don't have um, a whole lot of um, um, dependency on the BIOS, etc. as far as VFs are concerned. So when you start moving from WET to SF, now you have regained, um, you have added the mirroring uh, feature, but also you have regained offloads. So it's, it works in the same way as virtual functions. You just create an SF and give a representative to the OVS bridge port and the SF device to the service itself. Um, uh, so this is this is an example with um, with SFs. So you create an SF and instead of using a wet pair now as the output port, you just give the representative of the um, scalable function as the output port. And um, when you're creating the pod, you can just create give the SF device, which is a net dev. Um, you can just give it to a pod and the pod can then start um, working with um, the SFs itself. The good thing, as I said before, is uh, if you look at the diagram, SFs are pretty much at the same level as VFs. So the eSwitch um, knows about the SFs because it is actually a port on the eSwitch itself. And then it can just uh, switch packets in hardware, mm -hmm. uh, just like it, as it switches for VFs. And that kind of at least allows you to retain all the hardware cap offload capabilities. Now, moving one step um, above, right, from OVS to OVN. Now, we want OVN to start programming all these rules because we don't want to manually configure OVS rules uh, because OVN is the one that manages the bridge. So we don't want to go and manually do uh, o o uh, mirroring rules. Um, so OVN actually supports uh, the ability to create a mirror, add the logical switch port to the mirror, um, and then uh, the oven controller handles all the creation of the mirroring rules when both the um uh the uh the lsp and the um the uh, representer which has some indication that that is where you want to send the packet out are both on the same host so all this all of this is in the context of uh, mirroring on the same host uh, and not remote but oven supports remote as well if you want 
Then moving one uh, level high, we want all of this, uh, if you go to the next slide, Girish, mm -hmm. uh, if you, we want all this to be run through Kubernetes. We don't want to run oven, um, oven commands or OVS commands to uh, stitch together this um, feature, right? So we uh, use uh, this uh, a new CR, which is called port mirroring. Uh, and what this specifies is it gives us uh, the ability to uh, give information about the source, what needs to be mirrored, and what we call the sync local, which gives information about where to mirror the packets to. So when you talk about the source, you want to be able to pick and choose which pods, which VMs, and I'm not shown here, but you can also select which networks within those pods mm -hmm. and the VMs you want to uh, select a source for mirroring. Similarly, in the sync local, you want to be able to say what kind of device you want to um, mirror this packets to. It can be scalable functions, it can be virtual functions, uh, and some attributes of the scalable function itself. For example, you can, if um, the scalable functions has a number associated with it, and some applications probably care about that. So you can say, I want to pick a specific SF number uh, to as a sync uh, for this um, uh, for this mirror. So you can specify some of those. And when um, Avan CNI kind of watches on these uh, resources, when it sees it, it starts plugging in all the uh, um, uh, information required for us to enable this. For example, it goes on the node which um, on which the sync pod is created. It starts creating the SFs, it manages the SFs on those nodes. It creates the mirroring rules once the pod kind of uh, that matches the source pod source spec lands on that node and it creates all the mirroring rules within it. So uh, once you create the spec, once the pods are matched for the source and sync, uh, everything should be in place for the packets mm -hmm. to be start uh, mirrored to the um, target device. Uh, and um, the last slide is um, obviously this all comes with some limitations because um, OVS today um, does not allow us to uh, pick and choose what you want to mirror from a given packet, right? It's um, kind of an all of a nothing, all or nothing for a specific packet. So you can't say, I just want to give some um, headers. I just want to take the headers or a partial packet and things of that kind. Secondly, it doesn't support sampling. So if you want some application which is only interested in sampling, um, OBS mirroring doesn't support that. We could start looking at SFlow for that, but there are some other implications to that. Uh, and then there are some other limitations which are primarily driven by like hardware capabilities. For example, if you have a source port, if you want to mirror it to multiple target uh, devices, that could be a challenge. Um, and all of this, uh, uh, we have to be careful when we start mirroring packets because there are certain um, legal restrictions and contractual obligations that you'll have to kind of uh, consider when we do that. For example, we cannot just uh, start uh, uh, taking tenant packets and put pushing it to a remote location because there are a lot of user data uh, probably embedded in that. So we want to make sure that if there is um, uh, a need for us to encrypt certain things before we send it out, we do it. So we just have to make sure that when we do, when we enable this feature, we take all of this into consideration. But the idea is for us to be able to um, on demand, look at uh, packets real time on any of the interfaces of a Qbert VM without impacting the original traffic. Um, that's yeah. the, one of the very key things that we want to make sure, right? Because we don't want to start this mirroring and then figure out that the tenant application is now seeing jitter or uh, packet drops, Delays. Or latencies and things of that kind. Yeah. So the whole idea here is to be able to get um, an insight into the packets which are already in hardware. We don't want to disturb that, but just we just want to have this as a side conduit to uh, have visibility into that and um, work with that for whatever reason we want to do it. Uh, yeah, and, do, and doing it at wire speed, uh, thanks to all the uh, hardware offloads that's available uh, through OBS. Right, uh, and I think um, there are a lot the, on the, there are several backup slides and references um, for folks to look up mm -hmm. on um, uh, the technical details of what we have talked in this um, presentation. But um, we, if you have questions, I think we have a few minutes left. So we'll be happy to take any questions now. I'll unmute myself. Thanks, guys. That was wonderful. Um, we've got one question in chat. Uh, is, and it might have been answered just now. 
Is there performance loss for point mirroring here? If so, how much? When you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah, performance in the sense of, um, um, uh, so since everything is done in hardware, right? So we don't uh, incur any, there are some hardware resources, obviously, that will be used for this purpose. Uh, barring that, uh, there is not much from the CPU or anything that we use um, for just for the mirroring part of it. Okay, but if you have a service now which starts looking at these packets and if it starts doing something with those packets, then obviously there is some CPU utilization and some impact there um, because of that on some of those other services. So, from just point, from the point of mirroring, we don't anticipate a whole lot of performance impact. But as a result of consuming the mirrored packets and um, now uh, DMing uh, the packets, uh, if they are jumbo packets, for example, so there are some considerations around how that mirrored packets are being processed and utilized. That uh, would um, obviously um, use some of the system resources. The post processing takes more time than uh, than kind of uh, do you know cloning the packet and sending it out. Right. It's also uh, questions about um, what is the limit of sub devices using SROV switch dev? Like how many? So the 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 uh, the the number of VFs number of VFs that we can create is up to around two fifty six. Okay, two fifty six. If if you have a dual port adapter, you can create more. If you can disable the second port, um, the sub functions, uh, from what I know, uh, consume seventy five percent of the. VFs, it's not completely free. It's definitely lightweight compared to VF, but it's not like 10% uh, uh, or 20%, but it's like 75% of the VF. So if you have, if you have, if your uh, pod density is very high on a node, uh, we, you know, sub function is the way to go. You can kind of squeeze in more pods per node if you use uh, sub function uh, uh, instead of VFs. So I would say, uh, SFs would be the ideal thing to do if you want to if you want higher pod density on a node. Right. Cool. Um, we will have to wrap it up there. Uh, Liang did oh, add in okay. chat. Uh, yes, thinking about quality of service. Um, if there are any more questions that you have, please put them into the virtualization channel in the Kubernetes workspace. Uh, Venu and Girish, thank you very much for that talk. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, for thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you. Bye now.